I want to learn from uh, the mistakes of others so I don't have to make a fool of myself or uh, at least do my best to, uh, to not ruin my testimony in the short life I got here. Um, I was also kind of let down on, the, down on the way here to church. I, uh, I was informed. <laughs> I was informed that the unidentified flying object I saw on the way home Sunday night was not a true UFO. It was confirmed to be a satellite. But I thought I was going up because we drove right under this thing. And I, I, I think I held my wife's hand and said, Lord, yes, if, if this is how it's going to be, let's just speed up and let's just get this thing done with. We were, we were driving uh, on 96 in Howell and we seen this string of lights floating in the sky and we had only seen it for maybe a mile and I didn't see it. I was oblivious. You know, I'm just staring at the yellow lines. And she's like, what is that? And I, could, I, I couldn't believe it. We were getting closer to it. And we were getting closer to it. And I'm like, we are going under it. And I'm kind of like, um, okay. <laughs> like a string of white lights. And it was just offset. And I'm telling you, it couldn't have been, I don't know how high off the ground it was. It was pitch black at night. But it, it was not that high off the ground. And I was like, this is interesting. Got my blood pressure up a little bit. And I was like, ah, you know, it's nothing. It was a couple drones. It was nothing. No big deal, you know. I'm like, I'm over it. I'm over it. You know, and two seconds later, man, what was that thing, man? <laughs> and I could just not get over this thing. But for a couple days, uh, there was a couple other key witnesses. And uh, I was hoping to be able to let you guys in on the, on the, on the news. But then I was like, maybe the government's going to be listening and they're going to come after us because now you guys all know. But I would promise not to rat you guys out. I mean... I'm a sissy when it comes to pain, but if they interrogated me, I would do my best to just know I didn't tell anybody. No one at the church that was there that night is here now, so <laughs> I'm just teasing. It was interesting. I guess it was one of Elon Musk's UFOs. Um, but that got me thinking, man. I was like, what if that's what the Antichrist uses to deceive the people, man, like an abduction or something? And I'm not trying to get you thinking too much, but I try not to think about this stuff too much, but it got me kind of interested. I said, maybe, maybe, Lord, I'm on to something, but usually I'm not, up to, I'm, not, I'm not up to any good most of the time. And uh, I said, wouldn't that be something? I mean, he's the prince of the power of the air, and I'm telling you, it's like ever since this whole, uh, uh, as Pastor called it, the balloon festival's been going on. People are bugging out, man. Like at work, uh, we... You guys know I work on an ambulance. We have been running more psych calls than in this last week than ever before. Weird. Just weird stuff. I mean, maybe some of your eyes are bugging out and bulging out of your head, too. I don't know. But I'm going to just tell you, lay off the coffee, and it's going to be okay. <laughs> We're gonna, we are going to make it through this thing. Whether or not there's an abduction or not, it does not matter. We know, we know the abduction we're taking part of. It's the rapture of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we're going to meet him in the clouds, in the air, and you got nothing to worry about. Absolutely nothing to worry about in this lifetime. I'm so thankful that we've got some peace, and we can have some hope and some things that are sure, that are proven. And, and like I said, that these men, even in the Old Testament, tell us about and are hopeful for. How much more can we be hopeful for the things that are to come for our future here in this short life? Man, I'm telling you. Don't let what you're seeing on the news media, what you're hearing from, don't, don't get wrapped up in that stuff, church. It ain't, it ain't worth it. It ain't worth it. It's just going to get you, uh, man, just off your rocker. And I have a hard enough time staying on track as it is. And I, brought, I got a message here this evening in 2 Kings chapter 9 about misplaced passion. Misplaced passion. And a lot of people bring uh, things like that to the forefront of their mind when they think about Bible prophecy and strange things in outer space and the deeps and, and all, all these things that um, uh, are interesting, really interesting. I mean, man, what if that is what the Antichrist uses to deceive the masses? Who knows? Doesn't really matter. Not our problem, not our business. We're not going to have to deal with it. But people put so much passion and energy and, and zeal behind those things. They can really get you to believe uh, what they're saying is truth. And all I want you to know is the only truth you need in your life comes from the, the, the letters in black and white before you in the, the King James Bible. We got some hope tonight, and let's see if we can get a little help from this man, Jehu. 
on his misplaced passions. Let's see if we can learn a little bit something from him. We're going to read the first 10 verses of 2 Kings chapter 9. And um, we'll go ahead and pray after that. Say, I'm sorry, 2 Kings. 2 Kings chapter 9. Excuse me. Verse 1, the Bible says this. And Elisha the prophet called one of the children of the prophets and said unto him, Gird up thy loins, and take the box of oil in thine hand, and go to Ramoth Gilead. And when thou comest thither, look out there Jehu, the son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi, and go in and make him arise up from among his brethren, and carry him to an inner chamber. Then take the box of oil, and pour it on his head, and say, Thus saith the Lord, I have anointed thee king over Israel. Then open the door, and flee, and tarry not. So the young man, even the young man, the prophet, went to Ramoth Gilead, and when he came, behold, the captains of the host were sitting. And he said, I have an errand to thee, O captain. And Jehu said, Unto which of all us? And he said, To thee, O captain. And he arose and went into the house, and he poured the oil on his head and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I have anointed the king over the people of the Lord, even over Israel. And thou shalt smite the house of Ahab thy master, that I may avenge the blood of my servants, the prophets, and the blood of all thy servants of the Lord at the hand of Jezebel. For the whole house of Ahab shall perish, and I will cut off from Ahab him that pisseth against the wall, and him that is shut up and left in Israel. And I will make the house of Ahab like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, and like the house of uh, uh, Baasha, the son of Ahijah. And the dog shall eat Jezebel in the portion of Jezreel, and there shall be none to bury her. And he opened the door and fled. Brother Jesse Peck, could I have you pray for the message this evening? Amen. Thank you. Now we see here our storyline in chapter 9 starts with Jehu being anointed king over Israel. Now Jehu was a captain of the army of the king of Israel. And the king of Israel at that time was a man named Joram, who was the son of Ahab. Now if you've read your Bible any length of time, you know that Ahab was a very wicked man. The Bible sums him up in 1 Kings 21. I'll read this for you. 1 Kings 21, we get a real good summary of the, the bloodline that's been running through the nation of Israel, right from this verse here. But there was none like unto Ahab, which did sell himself to work wickedness in the sight of the Lord, whom Jezebel his wife stirred up. And he did very abominably in following idols. Now Joram, that man's son's in office. Um, Apparently now Jehu's in office. But you understand the, the bloodline and the, the hierarchy there and the, what's been passed down. You know what the, the father or what the parents do in moderation, the children were most certainly do in excess. So you know that Joram's doing things that daddy did. And honestly, I think he's probably doing more of the things that his mommy did, Jezebel. Now Jehu had just received instructions to go and annihilate the house of Ahab. This is all behind Ahab's back. Understand this. This young prophet, he was just called a, a child of the prophets there in verse 1. He goes into this camp, this group, this, this house is really what it is. And there's a, there's a litter of these, these soldiers, man, trained soldiers. The Bible says they're captains. He goes into Jehu, who's a captain, working for Joram. And he, he, the, the prophet goes there and says, Captain, I've got a word for thee. And the captain's like, really, man, who are you? You're just some young stripling. You're just some young punk. No, captain, for you, I need to speak with you. Takes him aside up into an inner chamber, the Bible says, and that young prophet anoints the head of Jehu and says, now you've been anointed king over Israel in Joram's stead. Joram doesn't even know this is going on, obviously. He says, I've got all these things, the list we ran through that I'm, I want you to do. So Jehu's anointed and Jehu's commissioned. Now, now, but Jehu understands who he's serving. He's serving the, he's son, serving the son of a, a wicked king. He received instruction to go annihilate the house of Ahab, including Joram, the king he's working for. And the interesting thing to me is that the men that work for the king, what it says there in some prior verses, they immediately, after they hear that the Jehu has been anointed, those captains that are in that inner chamber with him, they immediately rise up. They hailed, uh, they, they hailed Jehu as king. They take out their garments. They set them up there. It says up on the top of the steps, probably where Jehu is standing. And they're saying, all hailed, all hailed Jehu, our king. So that tells me a couple things. Jehu was probably a very respectable man. 
probably had some, uh, uh, probably had some, um, some credit amongst these captains. Probably no, no sissy. I mean, he was a captain of the army. The men respected him. And it also tells me that those other captains in the room and Jehu himself probably didn't think much about the king that was in office at the time. You need to understand, though, where we are in history in the nation of Israel. The kingdom was united under David. We understand that. That kingdom also stayed united under King Solomon. But we know that Solomon made some very, very bad decisions. He made some terrible decisions. And, and, and what those decisions are are very lustful decisions. And I'm just going to uh, just sum it up here with this one verse in 1 Kings 11. But King Solomon loved many strange women together with the daughters of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Zidonians, and Hittites, of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, Ye shall not go into them, neither shall they come into you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. And Solomon clave unto these in love. Solomon made some very bad decisions because the kingdom that was united under his daddy David and was united under his reign. The Bible tells us that in Solomon's later days, those women turned away his hearts after their gods. After, the, after those, those wicked gods, the gods of the Moabites, the Edomites, the Zidonians. Funny thing is that uh, Jezebel, the wife of Ahab, she was a princess of Zidonia before she came to office in Israel. As greed and idolatry have its way in Israel, the kingdoms divide. And we see a separation, which you've probably seen in your Bible as you read, this was the king of Israel, and this man was the king of Judah. There's a, there's a separation, those united kingdoms split into the nation of, uh, into the northern tribes, which is a.k.a. Israel, and into the southern tribes, also known as the tribe of Judah. Now, Jehu is not oblivious to what's going on here, and neither are the men, those captains in the room. They've seen times of civil war amongst their own king, kingdoms. They've also seen times of peace where the kings are at rest with one another. But currently, when we come to this story in 2 Kings chapter 9, he finds himself at a time of peace between the kingdoms. It, but it's a peace that's centered on wickedness and idolatry. You see, the, the, the two kings, the king of Israel and the king of Judah, they shared a, a like passion. They shared the same religion. They served, the God of, they served the gods of Baal. They were Baal, they were Baal, <laughs> Baal worshipers. And it's interesting to me that these two kings, that uh, these two men specifically haven't been at odds, but in the past, Israel and Judah, back, forth, back, forth, power struggle, fighting amongst each other, killing each other, killing their brethren. Jehu here finds himself at a time of peace, and I, I think it's interesting that men can unite uh, under a common, co under a com common cause in, in, in the face of wickedness. Y'all know the story there in the New Testament. I think it's Pilate and, and, Pilate and Herod. They come united. They were once at enmity amongst each other. But because they had a like passion to get rid of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says that they came together and became friends. Two men that absolutely hated each other. Because they had one desire, they could come together on that one thing. They had a desire to get Jesus Christ out of there. And I'm telling you, church, a large part of this world wants nothing to do with your Savior. They want nothing to do with Him because He interferes with their lustfulness. Our Savior interferes with their wickedness. And they will stop at nothing to get what they want. Jehu in this passage, has just been commissioned to wipe out the house of Ahab, and I think he's honestly looking forward to it. Like I said, I don't think he thought too much about his king. He's been commissioned to wipe out the, that king. He's been commissioned to wipe out the house of Ahab, wipe out Jezebel, all those Baalite priests and prophets. And you know what that reminds me of? is the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, church, if, if you can just hang in there a little while longer, there's coming a day, the Bible says, when this man... Uh, whether or not Jehu had a love for the Baalite gods or whether or not he had a, a love for God, I think clearly he didn't have a love for God. I kind of think he was right in the middle. Didn't really serve Baal, but he didn't, he didn't serve the God of the Bible. I think he was kind of right there in the middle, maybe atheistic. Maybe he didn't really know what he believed. Maybe he was uh, agnostic. But church, we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And what the Bible promises you is that one day, our enemy will be put underfoot. 
the Baalite gods, uh, the, 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 the Baalite idols, all those things one day, they're, they're no longer going to be an issue. They're no longer going to be a problem because the Lord Jesus Christ is coming back and he's coming back with a sword. He's going to come and set things straight. And what he says there is mortality might be swallowed up a life. And this, this corruption must put on incorruption. These bodies are going to be changed. Our minds are going to be completely changed. And I'm telling you, church, we've got something coming for us in the future that these, these Baalite worshipers, this world, they know nothing about. I'm thankful we get to take part of that thing. Now, Jehu eagerly accepts his promotion and commission. What we see over the next two chapters is God's judgment falling down hard on sin. Jehu's got a, really a lot of characteristics about him that I like. He's got a boldness, I'm telling you, he could, he could hang with the Old Testament prophets. Some of those just Bible pounded like Elijah, like Elisha. Man, he, he, was, he was tough. The problem is he didn't know how to harness the zeal, that passion that was put into him. Turn over with me, if you would, to 2 Kings chapter 10. Jehu did not know what to do with that passion that lied within him. 2 Kings Chapter 10 and verse 29. Really looks like Jehu gets a good start here. But let's just get to the end of the story. Howbeit from the sins of Jeroboam the son of Nabat, who made Israel to sin, Jehu departed not from after them. To wit, the golden calves that were in Bethel and that were in Dan. And the Lord said unto Jehu, Because thou hast done well in executing that which is right in mine eyes, and hast done unto the house of Ahab according to all that was in mine heart, thy children of the fourth generation shall sit on the throne of Israel. But Jehu took no heed to walk in the law of the Lord God of Israel with all his heart. For he departed not from the sins of Jeroboam, which made Israel to sin. Man, it sure looks like Jehu was a Bible believer. <laughs> I mean, he gets commissioned, he gets sent, and he accepts. He was real quick to grab that promotion. Real quick to grab the opportunity to go and, and, and just... Man, start swinging that sword. But I, I, I read this passage in verse 29, and I, I wonder if he even started right. I, I wonder if Jehu even had the right intentions to begin with. What I see as I examine this man's victories and defeats is a misplaced passion. What may at first seem like a zeal for God, I'm afraid in Jehu's reign was nothing more than a zeal to himself. Passionate, real passionate, man. We know some people that are passionate. You see people all around that are passionate. Like I said, people, people know how to talk. People know how to froth you up. News media knows how to froth you up. Get your emotions moving. Get you thinking. Get you compelled. Get you looking down, downstream in the wrong direction because you're like, maybe there's something valid to that. Maybe there's something legit about that. But I'm telling you what they're doing is they're promoting themselves. They're promoting themselves. My concern today and question for you, church, is what driving force is fueling you to serve God? What is it that is driving you and fueling you to serve your Savior? We all want to be, be a Jehu when it comes time for action. But what God has always been interested in is the reason you're doing what you're doing. Let's take a look at this very unique example we've been given in our Bibles of the passion of Jehu and see if we can learn a bit a little bit of something about him and see if we can draw closer to God because of this man's mistakes. I got three points. I'll do my best to make them quick here. I see an anointing passion over in 2 Kings chapter 9. An anointing passion, that's seen in the first six verses which we read. I'm telling you what, Jehu was promoted by God and God alone. That's seen, let's, check, let's just read it real quick in verse 4. Uh, did I say 1 Kings again? 2 Kings chapter 9. Verse 4, so the young man, even the young man, the prophet, went to Ramoth Gilead. And when he came, behold, the captains of the host were sitting. He said, I have an errand unto thee, O captain. And Jehu said, unto which of all of us? He said, unto thee, O captain. He rose, went into the house. He poured the oil on his head and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel. That's what a prophet's job is to do. Says, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel. Not me, not Elisha, because Elisha sent that young man. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel. I have anointed thee to be king over the people of the Lord, even over Israel. 
That promotion was clearly and undoubtedly a promotion from God. And that thing is confirmed if you run back over to 1 Kings chapter 19. God confirms that that, that, that that commission was actually sent out by the mouth of Elijah. He said, I'm going to set up Jehu to be king over these people. And whoever escapes the sword of uh, Haziel's shall Jehu slay. Whoever escapes the, of, the sword of Jehu shall Elisha slay. God had some big plans for Jehu. And I'm telling you what, God had wanted this man, and he, he wasn't, <laughs> and, and uh, you know what, he also had a backup plan. If Jehu was going to reject this thing, he said, hey, I'll send Elijah to take care of this. And I'm telling you, God wanted that man. And God wants men today. You know what we're not here in this church? We're, we're not Calvinists. You see, God doesn't have some sort of magnet drawn and got your number pulled. and He's going to draw you in and draw you in and draw you in until you can't resist the draw and the urge to, to come to God and to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. We do not believe that God does that. We believe in free will. I believe that Jehu had a decision he could have made here. Jehu could have, Jehu could have taken this anointing and done nothing with it. Just like you, Christian, could take your anointing he could do absolutely nothing with it. Turn over with me, if you would, one long stretch to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Church, I'm telling you, if you've been saved here today, man, you've been anointed. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 21, Now he which establisheth us with you in Christ, and hath anointed us is God, who hath also sealed us and given us the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. Let's break these couple verses down real quick. Now he which establisheth us with you in Christ. That establish means to fix, to make firm, to become more permanent. He's saying he's doing, he's fixing you in Jesus Christ. You see that in Christ. He hath anointed us. He said that the one who did that is God. Goes on to say, who hath also sealed us and given us the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. You know what happens the day you get anointed? You get the earnest of the Spirit. You know what that earnest is? It's a, it's a down payment. It's, uh, it's like uh, some collateral. It's the Holy Spirit given to you as a confirmation that you've been saved and that you've been anointed. It's not some sort of magic. It's the indwelling of the Holy Ghost of God. We understand these things. And Jesus Christ, I'm telling you what, he's coming back to finish up that contract. That's going to be the redemption of this vile body. He sealed us. Let's go back to 2 Kings. I'm telling you what, Jesus Christ didn't only anoint you with salvation, but he anointed your eyes to see. He anointed your mouth to preach the gospel. And he also allows you, like Mary, to anoint the feet of Jesus Christ and to bless him. And I think another added bonus benefit of that is we can sit at the feet of Jesus Christ and not only do our best to bless him. You know how she, she, cleaned, his, she cleaned his feet with her hair, man, and the odor, that, the odor of that perfume filled the room. And you know what amazes me and I can't help but think about? Man, I know I don't have long hair, never, never could. I noticed I'm balding. Sad thing. But my wife pointed that out a couple months ago. I said, whoa. <laughs> but you know what happens? That, 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 that hair resonated the smell of that anointing oil everywhere she went. And you women, I don't know how long that stuff lasts. But man, I imagine that that pure oil probably stayed in her hair for days, if not weeks, if not months. And she was reminded of how precious her Savior was. And the fact that she not only got to anoint his feet, but that she got to sit and learn of her Savior face to face. What a blessing that had to be for that woman. And I'm telling you what, the initial anointing is what is going to sustain you in this life. It's not the miracles. It's not the answered prayers. It's salvation. The initial anointing is what is going to sustain you in this Christian life. When times get tough, when there's things, there's unanswered questions, 
Yeah, I might think about the times I prayed through, but you know what I think about? I think about the time when I got a hold of God and he came and first met with me and gave me the earnest, the Holy Spirit, the comfort of the Holy Ghost. I think about that time. And I, I think about all the times I've doubted him. I think about all the times I've, 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 I've failed to think and to know that he can, can seal me and keep me, that eternal security. I think of all those times and I think, man, I've just been a fool this whole time. Man, it's the anointing process. It's, it's salvation. There, there, there's nothing more. Not everyone sees miracles. Not everyone gets to experience answered prayers maybe like you have. But one thing we all have in common as Christians is we've all experienced the anointing power of Jesus Christ in our life if we've asked him to save us. Now you keep your eyes open and you will see the miracles. You will have the answered prayers. You will get through the hard times. What I see in Jay, who was a man that was willing to risk it all. He was willing to accept promotion, but he was also willing to get bloody. He was willing to eradicate the sin that was obvious. But the one thing I don't see in Jehu was the, the, the interest in ever exposing or surrendering his inner man to God. You don't ever see this all through these two, two chapters that really speak of Jehu in, 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 in color. You don't see him ever surrendering that inner man to God. You see the physical. You see the sword swinging. You see the yelling. You see the hooting and hollering. You see the... You see the, the rah-rah, man, but you don't, you don't ever see Jehu getting on his feet or getting on his face and coming to God and saying, Lord, what a privilege it is to serve you. What a privilege it is to be able to do this in your name. From the perspective of Elijah, from our perspective, I think Elijah would have been the obvious candidate to pick up where Elijah left off, right? But God, what's interesting to me is that God saw fit to you the, use a heathen man. Jehu, I mean, why him? Why not just go right to Elijah? It makes me, it, it makes me think that, that God, I mean, he's still dealing with sinners. But it makes, me, it makes me think that he wanted to give this man a chance. And, and what a chance he had. Really, what, what a chance um, uh, Jehu had to get prayers answered, to see miracles. To, to really embrace walking like, like an Old Testament prophet would, man. What, what a sight he had to see. And to come to the end of his life and say, no, God, this has been cool. This has been fun, but it's just not for me. I'm just going to go back to Jeroboam. I'm going to go back to Jeroboam. And you know, you know Jeroboam's sins was building up those two calves for the nation of Israel to serve. I just, I, just, well, I, just, I just thought that was interesting. We'll leave in your mind that God is still dealing with sinful men. And he's, he's still trying to draw them in. He might go to some extreme lengths to do that. In his anointing passion, we, we also see that God has a plan. Jehu couldn't have planned the events that were going to take place, that do take place in this message uh, on his own. Both of these kings, the king of Israel and the king of Judah, were about to both be present uh, where, where Joram is. The man Joram and the man Ahaziah were both about to be present here. 2 Kings chapter 10 and verse 15. Take a look if you, if you would. 2 Kings chapter 10 and verse 15. Bum reference. Chapter 9, verse 21. 2 Kings 9, 21. You know what Jehu does? He gets right to the source. He gets right to the source. The two kings, king of Judah and the king of Israel. Look at verse 15. But King Joram was returned to be healed in Jezreel of the wounds with which the Syrians had given him. When he fought with Haziel, king of Syria, and Jehu said, If it be your mind, if it be your minds, then let none go forth nor escape out of the city to go to tell it in Jezreel. So Jehu rode in a chariot and went to Jezreel for Joram, lay there. And here he goes, and Ahaziah, king of Judah, was come down to see Joram. So, see, Ahaziah had heard that Joram was sick. He was injured. And, and, and happenstance is, this man's coming to the same place that Joram is. And Jehu's like, fellas, don't let this get out. 
Don't let the fact that I've been anointed king get out because I got a plan and I'm going to start executing judgment where it needs to be, where it needs to be executed first, right there with those wicked kings. I'm telling you what, God set this thing up. Both those kings were going to be present in Jezreel. He got an opportunity to slay both of them at the same time. And this opens up the gateway of bloodshed to ultimately exterminate the house of Ahab and his Baalite priests. Not only see an anointing passion, we see a correcting passion. I see a correcting passion. What I mean by a correcting passion is Jehu's going to right all the wrongs. Jehu's going to come in and he's going to do exactly what the prophet told him to do. That child, that prophet, the, 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 the young prophet that anointed him is going to do exactly what he told him to do. I mean, he's, good, he's a good church member. Preacher says do this. Jehu does that. I mean, you really think and Jehu's got this thing together. Is a correcting passion. And Christian, after you get saved, it's your job to get down to the root of the problem in your life and correct it. You know what I mean, you know what I mean by that? I mean, we, we, we don't even need to learn to hate sin. You just need to hate sin. You don't learn it. You, you don't ever learn to just hate sin. It's just something you do because you realize how destructive it is. You realize how much it's messed up your life and made you look the fool. You realize how, how wicked sin is and, 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 and how, how much of a grab it had on your life and still has on your life as a Christian trying to live for Jesus Christ today. You just hate sin. You need to correct some things after you get anointed, after you get saved. You need to correct some things in your life. And the only way to do that is hating the things that God hates. I don't know what that looks like in your life, but I know what it looked like in my life. Man, sin, man, it just travels up and down these bodies. In our eyes, out our mouth. It needs to be corrected, Christian. You know, for the longest time, man, just as a, not even just, always as a young Christian, man, probably for five years of my Christian life, you know, you know the verse that always kept coming to mind? It's been a while since I've had it repeated, not that I'm anything holy, but this, this is funny. This might be funny to you, but I needed to get beyond this point. It, it, this verse always came to mind when something stupid was going on in my head. You know the verse, thou fool this night, thy, sh thy soul shall be required of thee. You know the verse? The, 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 the rich man that had so much, he, 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 was, he, was, uh, he, he had so much, he needed to build bigger barns. That's all he was worried about was building bigger barns. And, and the Lord came to him, the master came to him and said, Man, you're so worried about these petty little things, thou fool. This night thy soul should be required of thee. And man, whenever I got caught up in something stupid in my mind, said, spouted off in my mouth, the Lord's like, thou fool. <laughs> This night thy soul should be required of thee. I was like, oh, man. Yeah, I got to get beyond that. That's some like baby Christian stuff. But that bogged me down for years and years. Petty things, little things, right? But to me, they were big things because I knew how much God hated sin. I knew how much God wanted that exterminated out of my life. But what did I do? What have we all done? Fall back to what we know. Hook up the old contacts we used to hang out with. Think we might be able to do them a, a, do them a favor. You know, you know all the verses. Evil communications, corrupt, good man. It just, it just doesn't work like that. You need to hate sin. And sometimes you need to run from it. And Christian, if there's something in your life that is bogging you down, Maybe you don't even know if it's sin or not. I'm telling you what, just give it up and just run from it. Because maybe this night thy soul shall be required of thee. And you're going to go up and answer to a holy God. Something you've been dabbling around with that you know you shouldn't be dabbling around with. And you're going to have to answer to him. I don't know. Man, take a, t take a line out of, my, out of my little head and just let that one roll around for a little bit. Helped me. Help me get out of a, little, a lot of trouble. Every time that thing came to my mind, I said, Lord, you're right, I've got to confess. A, uh, Jehu passionately hated sin. 
And that's what allowed him to accomplish these mighty works for God. His first victim's Jezebel. <laughs> well, his next, I'm sorry, his, his next victim, victim is Jezebel. The, the two kings were his first victims. And you can just get there for the sake, if you want to skim it while I, I say just a couple things about it. I'm not going to read it for the sake of time, but 2 Kings chapter 9. 2 Kings chapter 9, that's seen in verses 30 through 35. We all know Jezebel. That name rolls around a lot in any Bible-believing crowd. She was a heathen princess. I mentioned she was a Zidonian. She feared no man, and she certainly did not fear God. Ahab's actions were highly influenced by her. and Jehu took the credit for taking her life. We all know that Jezebel was killed. She was thrown down from the palace wall, and the Bible says the horses uh, stomped her underfoot, and Honestly, it's kind of a cool passage to read through, but get back there and read it when you got a minute. But God's prophecy again comes to fruition. Ahab takes his first victim. This is a little bit of a bloody sermon. I hope you don't mind. After Jezebel, Jehu rolls on to the 70 sons of Ahab. 2 Kings chapter 10 and verse 8. Go ahead and turn over there if you would. I would like you to see this one. Ahab's 70 sons. Jehu calls over there, and I think it's Samaria. Nahab had 70 sons in Samaria. That's chapter 10 and verse 1. Jehu wrote letters telling these, these men, and these elders, the people who were raising up Ahab's sons, saying, hey, I'm coming. And hey, I want 70 heads of the sons of Ahab by tomorrow. And he's serious. And these elders in the city are like, Ahab just stood up to two kings and killed them both. How are we going to stand up to this man? So what they did, those, those elders, those people in Samaria, what they did is they took and they filled up, they filled up I think it was uh, two baskets of heads. And they took them there at the entering into the gate. Verse 8, 2 Kings 10, verse 8, And there came a messenger and told him, saying, they brought the heads of the king's sons, and he said, Lay them in two heaps at the entering in of the gate until the morning. Why so bloody, man? Why so much bloodshed? Why the heads? Why these kids? Baal worshippers, man. Baal worshippers. God told them to annihilate them. You know how deep that stuff runs? Baalism was a wicked, wicked religion. You think it doesn't go on today? It does. It's all around you, man. Verse 9, And it came to pass in the morning that he went out and stood and said to the people, Ye be righteous. Behold, I conspired against my master, speaking of Joram, and slew him. But who slew all these? Talking about the seventy sons. Know now that there shall fall into the earth nothing of the word of the Lord which the Lord spake concerning the house of Ahab. For the Lord hath done that which he spake by his servant Elijah. Sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Bible believers, as far as I'm concerned, <laughs> but I, I see a little bit of a con contradiction here. Verse 9, he says, ye be righteous, telling the people, you're righteous judges. You judge what's going on here, people. I took my master's life, no doubt. But he's saying, who took the lives of these men, these 70, these 70 men, innocent men? Saying, well, you did it, didn't you? As far as I'm concerned, it's a little bit of blackmail under the cover of God. Didn't Jehu do it? This is where I start to see him falling apart. His story's starting to kind of break up a little bit. Isn't this Jehu's doing? Saying, hey, send me the heads. If not, I will use your imagination. I'm going to come get them myself. This is when his story falls apart, and his story falls apart even further here. Know not that there shall fall unto the earth nothing of the word of the Lord which the Lord spake concerning the house of Ahab. For the Lord hath done that which he spake by his servant Elijah. It's getting all spiritual here. It's getting spiritual. Now bear with me. Let me just try to build this point just a little bit further. Just a couple verses down. He comes unto a man named Jehonadab, the son of Rechab, uh, verse 15, coming to meet him, and he saluted him. He said to him, Is thine heart right, as my heart is with thy heart? And Jehonadab answered, It is. If it be, he says, Give me thy hand. And he gave him his hand, and he took him up into the chariot. And here's what Jehu says. He says, Jehonadab, 
Come with me and see my zeal for the Lord. So they made him ride in his chariot. And them two go on to kill and annihilate the, uh, the priests, his servants, all of them which have any, any doings with, uh, with, the Baal, with Baal worship. Those two go on in Jehu's zeal. I'm telling you what, if someone comes up to me and says, come and see my zeal for the Lord, I'm going to be like, dude, stay away from me, please. <laughs> right? Am I, am I way out in the left field here? Come and see my zeal, brother. <laughs> you know, I, I think we're starting to see his true colors come out here. A little bit of pride showing up. Uh, a little bit of pride showing up. Um, and I... I, I, I can't help but think this man, Jehonadab, he's like, dude, if I say anything other than my heart is right with you, you're going to lob my head off too. So let's go for a ride, man. He takes him up. He rides up in his chariot and he goes off and uh, on a ride they go because up next, up next comes probably the most interesting of them all. And I'll spark notes it real quick here for you, but there's a Baal worship going on. There's a meeting coming on and all the prophets of Baal Jehu actually fiends himself to be a Baal worshiper. He says, hey, I'm going to host a big, uh, a big worship meeting. We're going to burn sacrifices to the, to, we're going to burn sacrifices to Baal. And he gets all the people of the city, all the people in Israel, they come. Anyone that serves Baal, they come to this place, into this house. And you've probably read the stories. He puts all these men in black robes, all the Baal worshipers, and they host the event. And after the burning of the sacrifice, Jehu tells his men, now go in and slay them all. And he goes in and he wipes them all out. Now it looks like success, right? In Ahab's eye, or Jehu's eyes, it looks like success. I wiped them out. I wiped out Je Jezebel. I wiped out both kings. Took out his sons, man. I've taken out the whole family of Ahab. They're all gone. And then on top of that, I took out all the Baal worshippers. Probably feeling pretty good about himself. Ahab's done what he's been called to do. But I want to remind you, Christian, that success is obeying God when it's done with the right heart. Was Jehu obeying God? I think he was. But was his heart right with God? I don't see it. You come and tell me, prove me wrong, please, but I don't see it. And this thing might be preached a couple different ways, but... I understand that in God's eyes, obedience is better than sacrifice. And the heart has got to be right with God in order for the sacrifice to be accepted. You see, in this church, we're not trying to produce a bunch of maybe got saved Christians. We don't want a bunch of maybe I got saved. We want you to know when you get saved. Because I come from a church background where I didn't know if I was saved. That went on for years and years and years. It really did. It went on for years. Jehu falls into that realm and maybe got saved Christian. What a shame. What a shame. But we see as we come to the end of the chapter, chapter 10, we read how we fell back into the sins of Jeroboam. So all this time... Understanding the Jehu, man, man, it looks really good. Jehu, man, you're my guy. Like, if I ever needed to call upon someone to be you. But when I found out his heart wasn't right, it's like, man, I kind of distanced myself. I said, this story isn't as cool as it once was to me. You know? And that's what happens in the church. Someone's zeal can be so contagious. And we know in this life, it's not how you start, it's how you finish. And when we find out someone leaves or someone goes or someone cuts, comes through and cuts up the church with their zeal in the name of Jesus Christ and runs out and you find out they're a heretic after all, it hurts. And I find in Jehu just let down, me. You know, you're like, well, this is a story. It's, well, it is a story, but this is reality. And this is still reality today, church. People are going to let you down. People are going to come through, blow up, and get out. 
and they're going to stay out like Jehu stayed out. He reigned for 28 whole years. And the Bible says in verse 29, from the, uh, verse 29 in chapter 10, from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, who made Israel to sin, he departed not from after them. It was the golden calves. They had one set up in Dan, and they had one set up in Bethel. And he just, he couldn't get away from that, 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 that easy church. That's why Jeroboam set those calves up, is for easy church. That's what he wanted. He wanted convenience. He wanted to keep control of those people. He wanted to give them somewhere they could go and worship God within walking distance. Sounds like church today. Every corner, every turn you make, a new church, preaching easy believism, Calvinistic, all over, all over the board. All over the board. It's everywhere. And to drive from Davisburg or Davis, to drive from way up there to come here to church encourages me. Because there's still people out there, in here, that don't want to end up like Jehu. They want to finish right. Maybe they didn't start right. They want to finish right. Have I mentioned I love Jehu zeal? <laughs> I do. And I know some of you have a great desire to serve God and you feel less than satisfied unless you are physically doing something for God. I mean, like me, I like to have my hands. I like to be serving. I've been asked recently, what can I do around here to serve God? Can I do this? Can I do that? I say, yes, you can do all those things. But to be honest, we're not a big church. We don't have a lot of service-like positions, but we could always use a toilet scrubber. You hate to lead off with that one. Yeah, man, you want to clean the toilets? <laughs> but I'm that way. I like to be able to put my hands to it and feel like I'm actually serving God. And I'm telling you what, I love zeal. I love Jehu's zeal, but I'm just not where I was 10 years ago in my zeal. I wish I had some of it back. Maybe with time and some help from God, I could get a little bit of it back, but I've shared with you some stories of my zeal in the past. Most of them are quite embarrassing. Zeal's good, sets a fire in your bones, lets you know that the anointing was real in the Christian life. But what I, what I want to encourage you tonight, Christians, is that we need to learn to just be Christians because godliness with contentment is great gain. The zeal's amazing. But I'm telling you what, sometimes it just blows in and it blows out and you're like, that was fun, but when's it going to happen again? With no guarantees. No guarantees when it's going to happen again. You know what contentment is? It's the opposite of envy. It's humility. Contentment is the opposite of anxiety, but it's peace. You know what you can find in serving Jesus Christ? Not worrying about UFOs. <laughs> Sorry for even bringing that up. You can find peace. Peace that you can't find outside of those doors. You can find peace in Jesus Christ. Now, I've got a feeling Jehu was doing what he was doing because it felt right to do. Because it felt right to do. I'm going to do my best to get you out of here in five minutes. Jehu's passion, as we can see, and maybe you'll agree with me, I believe was very pretend. And the conclusion of the message is this. It's not a very positive one. Understand that all ages of history, all through time, from the beginning of man until the end of this age, in the last days, we say we're in the last days, they all end in apostasy. Every age has and every age to continue from this point will end in apostasy. And God's not going to do anything about it. Now, I don't say that arrogantly like God can't do anything about it, but I'm telling you, God is not going to do anything about that fact. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. 
That's our God. He doesn't change. And the sooner you can realize that and adopt that into your heart and your mind when you read this Bible, it'll make your Christian life so much easier. It's just a natural progression of the world. And, 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 and there's nothing, I promise you, there's nothing he's going to do about it. Because man left to himself without coming to a saving knowledge of God, whether that's the Old Testament God of Israel or the Lord Jesus Christ, man left to himself without that saving knowledge is programmed to self-destruct. And I'm telling you what, people do not change in this life because they don't want to change. They just simply don't change because they don't want to change. God will not leave someone seeking for the truth out high and dry, though. Understand me there. If you came seeking for truth, now you're in the right place. But if this is not what you're looking for, the truth, I'm going to say it. You're never going to amount to anything more than a Jehu. You never will. You're, you may have zeal, which may explode for just a moment of time. But we see how Jehu ends. Desperate, destitute, just no good for nothing. What a, what a history story. And then to end of those three, four verses, we're like, ah, dude, what a mess up. I don't want to be that mess up, man. I want to finish right. His zeal is captivating, man. It's super captivating. But it was there for just a few short moments. And I'm telling you, for Israel, it really did look hopeful for just a little while. But Jehu ended up submitting himself to the popular voice of the people, reverting back to Israel's pagan ways. 2 Timothy 3 says this, and I'm done, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. A form of godliness, but you deny the power thereof. He says, from such, turn away. Christian, I'm telling you, you've got something in Jesus Christ that will last you for an eternity. And you don't have to be the sharpest sword on the shelf or the shiniest one at that. What God wants from you is to be able to control you with his finger. He could only control Jehu for just a little while. And when that finger came off and the sword got put in his holster and he went back to his old ways of life, just like when we walk out of these doors and we're not here 99% of the time, when you put up your sword and you're left by yourself, what decision are you going to make? Are you going to be controlled by zeal in a wavering, misplaced passion like Jehu? Or are you going to let God control you? And you serve him faithfully. That's the message. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, I just want to thank you for loving us and giving us men in the Bible like this that we can learn a few things from. Father, Jehu's zeal does get us a little bit excited for what's to come second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ when all of your enemies and in turn all of our enemies, Lord, will get put down. But Father, I don't want to just be a Christian full of zeal and no heart. I want to have heart that pleases you and, and Father, a mind to do the same. I don't want to just be full of zeal, Lord. Matter of fact, I'll just give you all, all my zeal. If I could just sit at your feet for just a little while and anoint your feet, tell you how much I love you and how much I thank you for what you've done for us. Not just me personally, but us as a church. Father, we want to tell you we love you. We thank you for all that you do for us through this church, through our brothers and sisters here, but most importantly through the Bible, God. Thank you for being with us. Keep our preachers safe. Keep those here that have medical needs and a, a need for a healing. Father, uh, keep them under your arms and keep them close, Lord. Let them know we love them and we're praying for them daily. Keep us safe as we go, we pray in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.